and it moves um when the when as uh, whenever sound is produced no so whenever this part moves um in the case of a speaker uh it is at actually attached to a magnet which vibrates in and out so whenever it vibrates, uh, it compresses the air around it. So if you notice here, the air is more compressed. And then when it moves backward, the air is uh, rarefied or decompressed. So these changes in air pressure are transferred away from the speaker at the speed of sound, which is about 343 meters per, per second. So this is basically how sound is so there are many sources of sounds, such as vibrating strings or stereo speakers reproducing the sound of a stringed instrument, uh, which can also produce vibrations in air pressure that are rhythmic and thus produces sound. So a concept um, that you have to know about sound is frequency. So frequency is the number of compressed or rarefied patches of air that passes by our ears each second. So one cycle of a sound is the distance between successive compressed air patches. So between this um, point up to this point. So this is expressed in units called hertz. So hertz is the number of cycles per second. So if we notice um, in the graph, this plots the air pressure versus the distance um, for a sound of constant frequency and intensity. So the x-axis can also represent time because the velocity of sound is constant naman. So frequency is the number of sound waves per unit of time or distance. And we perceive high frequency waves as having a higher pitch. So pitch is determined by frequency. So our auditory system can respond to pressure waves over the remarkable range of 20, 20 hertz up to 20,000 hertz. Although this audible range uh, can decrease significantly, especially at high frequency. So hindi lahat from 20 hertz up to 20,000 hertz um, can be played, uh, I mean, can be heard. So I will be... Um, I will be playing a video um, with with a sound para ma-appreciate natin yung 20,000 to 20 hertz. So tingnan natin um, what to the sound. Um, you can check if hanggang saan yung una yung narinig and kailan, kayo, kailan yung part na last yung narinig. So I will be um, playing this. Sorry, man. Sorry, Doc. I read this, man. It's just for long, but. Okay. So you can adjust your um you can adjust your the volumes of your earphones in case you feel a little discomfort from this from the audio of this um video I will be sharing. Pero I want you to take note kung saan part nyo unang narinig yung sound and when you last hear the sound. May narinig na ba kayong sound? Ayan. 
I will stop na po at this point kasi medyo masakit na siya sa tenga. Pero basically, this is um just to to for us to um appreciate what the 20, 20 hertz and the 20,000 hertz sounds like. So if we notice, um, if we notice, masyadong wide yung range ng ating kayang marinig. Pero there are also frequencies na um, hindi na natin kayang when we get older, hindi na rin natin uh, kayang marinig. So I will go back to my slides. Okay. So although humans can hear uh, a great range of frequencies, there are high and low sound waves. Um, uh, sound frequencies our, our ears cannot uh, hear. So just as there are electromagnetic waves of light that our, our eyes cannot see. So the range of intensity to which the human ear is sensitive is actually astonishing. The intensity of the loudest sound na pwede nating marinig is about a trillion times greater than the intensity of the faintest sound. So the uh, intensity determines the loudness of the sound and it is the air pressure difference between peaks and throws of the sound waves. So if um, kanina... Um, yung frequency is between this two. So, intensity naman is yung height niya. So, real-world sounds are uh, rarely consist of just simple rhythmic sound waves at one frequency and intensity. So, it is actually the combination of simultaneous combinations of different frequency waves at different intensities. So, that's why we hear um, different uh, kinds of music and then different uh, voice qualities that are unique to each person. So now let's uh, begin to discuss the structure of the auditory system. So the components of the ear uh, is shown in this um, picture. The visible portion of the ear consists primarily of a cartilage-covered skin forming a sort of a funnel called the pina. So it, um, it is a Latin for wing which helps collect sound from a wide area. So the shape of the pina, para siyang conical, uh, makes us more sensitive to sounds coming from a head. So paharap din siya. So hindi masyado natin marinig yung likod compared sa harap. So we are more sensitive to sounds coming from ahead of us. So the convolutions of the pina, so may reasons kung bakit meron siyang convolutions. So... It plays a role in localizing sounds as well, and we will be discussing this later in uh, brief. So in humans, the pina is more or less fixed. So un unlike sa mga pusa or in other animals na kaya nilang pagalawen yung kanilang ear um, to direct it to the sound. So tayo, our pinas are uh, fixed. Unless yung sa iyo hindi, pero usually fixed siya. So the entrance um, to the internal ear is called the auditory canal. So this is the auditory canal. And then this can extend about an inch more pa inside the skull before it ends in the tympanic membrane. So this blue area is the tympanic membrane. This is also known as the eardrum. So connected to the medial surface of the tympanic membrane is a series of bones called the ossicles. So ossicles is literally, literally means tiny or little bones in Latin. And they are indeed the smallest bones in the body. So look, this is located in an air-filled chamber. Um, and the ossicles are movement from the tympanic membrane to the inner ear here in the oval window. So behind the oval window. So this is just an overview. I will be discussing this in detail later. So behind the oval window is a fluid-filled cochlea which contains the apparatus for transforming the physical motion of the oval window membrane into a neuronal response. So thus, the first stage of our basic auditory pathway looks like this. So una, the sound waves would enter um, through the auditory canal and then it will hit the membrane. So when the tympanic membrane moves because of the sound, the ossicles in turn move so they are like tiny hammers, and when the ossicles move, the membrane at the oval window will also move. And the motion in the oval window will create a series of movements inside the cochlea, which I will also be discussing later in detail. 
So the ear is uh, divided into, uh, I mean, the auditory system is divided into the outer ear, middle ear, and the inner, inner ear. So the structures from the pina up to the tympanic membrane, this is the outer ear. So inside um, the middle ear, it consists, constitute the ossicles and there are muscles here, which I will also be discussing later. And uh, the apparatus medial to the oval window is the inner ear. So everything here is the inner ear. So for an overview, once a neural response or sound is generated in the inner ear, so a signal is transferred to and processed by a series of nuclei in the brain stem. And then the output from this nuclei is sent to a relay in the thalamus um, called the MGN or the medial geniculus. So finally, the MGN would project to the auditory cortex. So they say that the, uh, the auditory pathway is more complex compared to the visual pathway. However, they do have analogous um, no? So there are also receptors um, which connect to an early integration system and then to a thalamic relay and then to the sensory cortex. So they are almost similar. So now let's discuss the middle ear. So in the middle ear, variations in air pressure are converted into movements of the ossicus, as discussed earlier. And in this section, we'll explore how the middle ear performs an essential transformation of sound energy. So we can focus on this um, magnified uh, area of the middle ear. So the structures within the middle ear are the tympanic membrane and the two tiny muscles that attach the ossicle. So later, um, I have a picture of those muscles and their function. So the tympanic membrane is somewhat conical in shape and then the cone extending into the cavity. So para siyang nakaganon. There are three ossicles, each named after an object it slightly resembles. So the malleus is uh, a have called uh, also known as forms a rigid connection with the incus or the anvil, and the incus forms a flexible connection with the stapes or stirrups. So the flat bottom, um, if you can notice here, of the stapes, which is called the float foot plate, moves in and out. So this is moving in and out like a piston at the oval window. So this is the oval window. So movements of the foot transmit sounds to the fluids of the cochlea in the inner ear. So the air, so di ba na mention natin kanina that the middle ear is air filled. So the, the air in the middle ear is actually continual with the air in the nasal cavity through the eustachian tube. So this, um, green part is the eustachian tube and there is a valve that uh, is usually closed but um pwede siyang mag open so later i will be discussing that so when you are in for example i think most of us have already read um, ridden an airplane so when you are ascending in an airplane or a car paakyat yung car sa mountain so the pressure of the surrounding air decreases so there is less pressure here pressure inside your middle ear. So the, the result is that the tympanic membrane bulges outside. So if we notice, um, whenever this happens, masakit sa siya sa tenga. So this can be um, alleviated by doing equalization. So equalization just means opening this part of the eustachian tube para mag-equalize yung air outside and inside the middle ear. So you can do this uh, using the point B maneuver or using a valsalva maneuver. Same happens when you are descending, no? so pag palanding na yung plane. So the air pressure outside becomes higher than the air pressure inside. So what happens is that your um, tympanic membrane um, is pushed in. So this also causes pain and can also be alleviated by doing equalization. So, question, bakit hindi na lang diretso yung sound from the outer ear to the oval window? Why do we need um, this uh, middle ear apparatus? So, the problem is that the cochlea is filled with fluid. So, the fluid has, a, fluid has a higher density. So, if only the air would hit the oval window, force will not be enough for it to move the fluid inside. So use, use of the middle 
ear. Um, and specifically, the ossicles is sound amplification. So um, the sound waves move the tympanic membrane and the ossicles in turn move another membrane at the oval window. So without this, um, the sound that you will would be significantly um, lower. So I don't know if you've ever tried uh, free diving or scuba diving. If you notice um, how it is quieter underwater, so you know well that water reflects sound coming from above. So the fluid in the inner ear is the same. It resists being moved much more than air does. So how can, um, how can sound force amplification happen. So it can be achieved if the pressure at the oval window, the pressure here, greater than the pressure at the tympanic membrane. And this only happens if one, if the force on the oval window membrane is greater than that of the tympanic membrane. And the second is the the surface area of the oval window is smaller than that of the tympanic membrane. So in the middle ear, if we can notice, um, this is already achieved no, through the mechanism of the middle ear. So what is the attenuation reflex? So if you remember, I mentioned earlier that there are also two muscles attached to the ossicles and they have a significant um, uh, function. So the muscles are uh, first the tensor tympani muscles, so muscle, so this is the tensor tympani muscle, which is anchored to bone in the cavity of the middle ear at one end and attaches to the malle at the other end. And the other muscle is the stapedius muscle, so this is the stapedius muscle, which also extends from a fixed anchor of the bone and attaches to the stapes. So ano purpose nito? So when we experience um, high frequency sounds, um, so the, the onset of a loud sound triggers a neural response um, that causes these muscles to contract. So ang, ang nangyayari is that the movement of the ossicles are also limited. So in turn, if the movement of the ossicles are limited, so limited the new movement dito, um, and in turn, the sound is attenuated. So this in, uh, suppresses these and higher frequencies and activated when we speak. So this enables us to understand speech in a noisy environment. And um, this is also so that we don't hear our own voices as loudly as otherwise we otherwise would kung wala yung attenuation reflex. And this also allows us to adapt uh, to continuous sounds at high intensities. Next, let's discuss the inner ear. The inner ear consists of the cochlea, which is part of the auditory system, and the labyrinth, which is a part of the vestibular system. So the cochlea is um, Latin for snail and has a spiral shape. So it resembles a snail shell. So this figure shows the cochlea cut in half. So in the cochlea, the hollow tubes has walls made of bone. And the central pillar of cochlea is a conical bony structure. So the cochlea, if you roll this up, is just the size of a pea. So maliit lang siya. So at the base of the cochlea are two membrane-covered um, um, holes. So first is the oval window, which is, which is um, primarily moved when um, sound conduction and uh, the round window, which is found here, if you can see this area. So if the cochlea is cut in cross-section, we can see that the tube is divided into three fluid-filled chambers, the scala vestibuli, the scala media, and the scala temp. The three scalae wrap around inside the cochlea. It's like a spiral um, staircase. And uh, the Reisner's membrane, so this is the membrane dividing the scala visibly and the scala media. And the basilar membrane divides the scala media from the scala tympani. So sitting on the basilar membrane is the organ. 
organ of Corti contains auditory receptor neurons. And over this is uh, the tectorial membrane. So at the apex of the co cochlea, the scala media is closed off. So if we roll around, um, I mean, uncoil the cochlea. So by the end, um, by the apex, the scala media is already closed off. And the scala tympani and the scala vestibuli are continue, become continuous through a hole called the helicotrima. So at the base of the cochlea, the scala vestibuli meets the oval window and the scala tympani meets the round window. So basically, the state piece, when it hits the, the, the fluid or the perilymph would travel here um, in the scala vestibuli, pass through the helicotrima and then through the scala tympani, and then um, which will cause the round window to bulge. Um, all this movement would also cause the basilar membrane to move. Okay. So for us to be able to appreciate this better, um, I will be showing you a video um, on how everything works. Um, para ma appreciate po natin. So let me share um, my my. Due to the flexibility of a membrane called the round window, the stapes movement can displace the paralymph, allowing vibrations to enter the labyrinth. The corridor leading to the round window is found within the spiral portion of the bony labyrinth known as the cochlea. Vibrations produced by the stapes are drawn into the spiral system and return to meet the round window. The portion of the spiral passage in which vibrations ascend to the apex of the cochlea is called the scala vestibuli. The descending portion of the passage is called the scala tympani. A third structure, called the cochlear duct, is situated between the scala vestibuli and the scala tympani. The cochlear duct is filled with a fluid called endolymph, and when viewed in cross-section, the membranes separating the two fluid-filled systems are visible. They are Reissner's membrane and the basilar membrane. The membranes are flexible and move in response to the vibrations traveling up the scala vestibuli. The movements of the membranes then send vibrations back down to the scala tympani. The structure, called the organ of Corti, is situated on the basilar membrane. As the basilar membrane vibrates, the organ of Corti is stimulated, which sends nerve impulses to the brain via the cochlear nerve. The actual nerve impulses are generated by specialized cells within the organ of Corti called hair cells. The hair cells are closely covered by a structure called the tectorial membrane. As the basilar membrane vibrates, the tiny clusters of hairs are bent against the tectorial membrane, triggering the hair cells to fire. The entire basilar membrane does not vibrate simultaneously. Instead, specific areas along the basilar membrane move variably in response to different frequencies of sound. Lower frequencies vibrate the basilar membrane closer to the apex of the cochlea, whereas higher frequencies produce vibrations closer to the base. This arrangement is known as tonotopic organization. 
So I will end the video there. So the, for the physiology of the cochlea, so the sound travels uh, in, as the sound travels into the ear canal, the tympanic membrane vibrates, the ossicles move. So this is just a summary. And then there is an inward motion of the oval window, which push, pushes the fluid or the perivestibuli through the helicotrema, which will go back down to the scala tympani through the round window and the basilar membrane, which is flexible, which uh, bends in response to the sounds. So now we come to the point in the system where the neurons are first involved. So the auditory receptor cells, which converts mechanical energy into a change in membrane polarization are uh, located in the organ of corti. So the organ of corti consists of hair cells, as we have seen earlier, the rods of corti, and various supporting cells. The auditory receptors are called hair cells because each one has 10 to 300 hairy-looking stereocilia. So, ito, my stereocilia. So hair cells are actually not neurons. Uh, they lack axons, and in mammals, they do not generate any axons action potentials. So hair cells are specialized epithelial cells and um, the hair cells and stereocilia um, shown here um, So the critical event in the transduction of sound into a neural signal is the bending of the cilia. So for this reason, we um, that is the reason why uh, the organ of, of corti is um, very important. So when the basilar membrane moves in response to a motion at the stapes, the entire foundation supporting the hair cells also move. So there are recordings from hair cells that indicate that when the cilia bend in one direction, the hair cell polari depolarizes. And when they bend in the other direction, the hair cell hyperpolarizes. So when a sound wave causes the cilia to bend back and forth, the hair cell generates a receptor potential that alternately hyperpolarizes and depolarizes from the resting potential um, e millivolts. So there are special ion channels that uh, in the serocilia, which can open when the tip links uh, joining the serocilia and stretch. So the entry of potassium depolarizes the hair cells and um, which opens voltage gate. So the auditory nerve consists of the axons um, of neural bodies are located in the spiral ganglion. So the spiral ganglion neurons is actually the first in the auditory pathway to fire action potentials and provide all the auditory uh, information sent to the brain. And the vast information leaving the cochlea comes from um, the inner hair cells. So the outer hair cells actually outnumber the inner hair cells, but 95% of the spiral ganglion communicate with the inner hair cells. So what are the outer hair cells for? So the outer hair cell motors that amplify the movement of the vascular membrane during low intensity sound, sound stimuli. So the action of the outer hair cell on the vascular membrane is called a cochlear amplifier. So how is it an a cochlear amplifier? So there are um, pristine molecules which are tightly packed uh, into membranes of the outer hair cell bodies and they are required for outer hair cells to move in response to sound. And a possible molecular mechanism of the cochlear amplifier is located right in the hair bundles. A special type of the contractile muscle protein myosin is attached to the upper end of the tip links. And myosin and other tip link proteins may somehow rapidly enhance the movement of the hair cells. On to weak sounds. 
So this idea is actually controversial. So the am amplifying effect of the outer hair cell explains how antibiotics, uh, such as canamycin, which is known to cause deafness, um, can actually um, uh, actually does it by damaging the hair cells. So after excessive exposure to antibiotics, many inner hair cells um, are uh, become less sensitive to sound. So kaya yun yung mechanism kaya some antibiotics can cause deafness. So now let's um, go to the central auditory processes. So we'll go from the peripheral now going um, more central. So the afferent um, afferents from the spinal ganglion, uh, spiral ganglion, enter the brain stem in the auditory vestibular nerve. And the axons innervate the dorsal cochlear nucleus here and the ventral cochlear nucleus uh, so in the same side to the cochlea. And then the ventral cochlear nu nucleus um, projects both to the superior olive um, and uh, the right and left superior olive. So this is why they say that the, the auditory system is more complex because one track. So once it um, projects from the ventral cochlear nucleus, it um, projects both to the right and left superior olive. And then the axons of the olivary uh, neurons ascend to the lateral lemniscus in the lateral lemniscus and innervate the inferior collector of the migraine. So although there are other um, routes from the cochlear nuclei to the inferior colliculus, uh, the additional intermediate release and uh, with additional intermediate release, all ascending auditory pathways converge to the inferior colliculus of the mid. The neurons in the inferior colliculus send access to the medial jugulate body here of the thalamus, which in turn projects to the auditory cortex. There are certain um, things to note regarding um, the auditory pathway. So first is that the projections and brainstem nuclei, other than the ones described, contribute to the auditory pathways. So for instance, the inferior colliculus can send axons not only to the medial geniculate nucleus, but also to the superior colliculus where uh, there is integration of auditory and visual information, and also to the cerebellum. Second, there is extensive feedback in the auditory pathway. For instance, the brainstem neuron neurons that contact other hair cells and auditory cortex sends axons to the MGN and inferior colliculus as well. So my feedback mechanism. Third, each cochlear nucleus receives input from just the one ear on the ipsilateral side and all other auditory nuclei in the brainstem receive input from both ears. So this explains a clinically important fact that only the only way by which brainstem, da brainstem damage can produce death in one ear is if the cochlear nucleus or the auditory nerve on one side is destroyed. Okay, next. Uh, are response properties of neurons in the auditory pathway. So most spiral ganglion cells receive input from a single hair cell as, as, received er, uh, as discussed earlier um, and at a particular location on the basilar membrane. And the, they fire action potentials only in response to sound within a limited frequency range. So the neuron is most responsive to sound at one frequency. So this is called the, the neuron's characteristic frequency. And it is less responsive to um, neighboring frequencies. So pairing specialized sila. So as the stimulus gets more intense, the basilar membrane um, vibrates with greater amplitude. So we are now discussing stimulus intensity. And the membrane potential of the activated cells is also higher. So they are more depolarized or polarized. So as a result, 
the nerve fibers at which the hair cells synapse fire action potentials at greater rates. So the loudness actually that we perceive is also correlated with the number of neurons in the auditory nerve um, that triggered and their firing rates. So more intense stimuli produce movements of the basilar membranes over a greater distance as well. So the loudness we perceive is correlated with the number of active neurons in the auditory nerve. So next is localization of sound. So how do we know where a sound comes from? So an obvious cue to the location of a sound source is the time at which the sound arrives at each ear. So if we are so if we are not facing the sound directly, it takes the sound longer to reach one ear compared to the other. So for example, in this image, so if the sound is coming from the right, so obviously the right ear would perceive the or would reach um or the sound would reach the right ear first. Now, so this delay, the specific delay, um, is actually one of the ways in which um we perceive the location of the sound. So since it will arrive at your left ear at a later time, so this is known as the interaural time delay. So since the distance of your, between your ear, depending kung gaano kalaki yung head mo, is approximately around 20 centimeters, so the sound coming from the right perpendicular to your head will reach this ear at approximately 0.6 millimeters, uh, millisecond after reaching your right ear. So that delay in itself is enough to, for us to know where the sound is coming from. So this is uh, when we are listening to sound at the horizontal plane. So there is a difference also depending on the distance of, I mean, the direction of the sound. So this one, ito yung example kanina, if directly perpendicular. If it comes at an angle, it will be a little bit hard to determine where the sound is coming from. But there is still a significant delay. The 0.3 milliseconds can still be perceived. Um, so we can still know where, where sound is. Ang mahirap is if the sound comes directly straight at us, so this is an equal distance between the two ears. So since hindi tayo um, horse or cat na kaya nila yung ear natin, so what we usually do, di ba, as a response to hearing um, sound, hindi natin alam saan, usually ginagalaw natin yung ating ear. So that is or adding head. So that is enough for us to identify where the sound is coming from. So a problem also is when there is continuous, there is a continuous tone. If the tone is continuous, um, it might also be harder to perceive where it is from since um, both ears are already activated. Okay, now, so how do we localize sound? Um, uh, through a horizontal plane in high frequency. So when there are high frequencies, there is what we call um, shad a sound shadow. Basically, the brain has another process for sound localizations at high frequencies. So since walang hindi masyado significant yung interaural intensity difference, um, when there is high frequency sound, we um, rely on the sound shadow. So let's summarize the two processes for localizing sound. No? So if the sound is low frequency, so um, around uh, with sounds in the range of 20 to 2,000, involves the interaural time delay as previously discussed. But if the sound is um, from the 2,000 to 20,000 hertz, um, interaural density difference is used. So that is um, the sound shadow. So together, these two processes constitute the duplex theory of sound localization. So yung sound shadow, basically, parang we feel more, parang we feel a little deaf here on the other ear if there is high frequency sound coming um, straight directly to, for example, the right ear. So the combined sounds uh, direct and reflect, uh, which is subtly uh, different when it comes from above. Oh. So kapag galing naman sa taas or sa baba yung sound, so the vertical localization of the sounds um, is uh, facilitated by the convolutions of the pina. So the arrows here um, show that, for example, if... Um, sound is coming from this uh, this area. So path three and you follow natin. So it bounces off the sound towards the ear. And 
we localize um the sound um uh, where it coming where it is coming from so finally we go to the auditory cortex so the primary auditory cortex or a1 corresponds to Broadman area 41 in the temporal lobe. So temporal lobe you involved. So its location lies in the superior temporal gyrus of the temporal lobe and it can extend to the temporal lobe. Uh, it extends into the lateral sulcus and the transverse temporal gyri. So acting sleeping, the medial geniculate nucleus projects to the auditory cortex via the internal capsule in an array called the acoustic radiation. So how does um how, how where do we uh, I mean what is the neurophysiology of auditory hallucination? So there are certain journals which um, describe um where auditory hallucinations may come from. So this one uh from from the, I'm sorry, though, for, uh, the journal uh, entitled The Neurophysiology of Auditory Hallucinations by Lutherfield. So they describe that uh, there are early symptom capture studies that says that the presence of vocal spike discharges during episodes of disturbance or hallucination or both, and to the presence of changes in the activity lobe and probably the frontal lobe during hallucination so the temporal lobe is uh, primarily involved because as we know um, that is also where we can find our, our auditory center and power increases during hallucinations in the temporal region so there are focal spike discharges so in contemporary symptom capture studies they, they saw that there is increased activity in the left superior temporal cortex, left superior temporal gyrus during uh, hallucinations. And nonverbal auditory hallucinations were associated with an increase in activity in the left superior temporal cor cortex, while commanding hallucinations were associated with the same activation pattern extending into the left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. So, so these studies basically just to, just told us um as just telling the location um involved when there are auditory hallucinations. But how do they actually happen? So Feinberg in 1978 suggested that malfunctioning of the corollary discharge mechanism might underlie the experience of auditory hallucinations. So corollary discharge is a basic feed-forward system. So it is involved in suppressing the sensory consequences of self-generated actions. So self-generated actions meaning walang trigger, um, parang um, it's uh, likened to a seizure event. So without the corollary discharge mechanism, um, the auditory um, the audit the auditory area of the brain is triggered. So there are self-generated actions. So in a well-functioning corollary discharge system, a signal is sent from the frontal area involving inner speech. So ibig sabihin, walang vocal, walang expressive language. So this is just inner speech to temporal speech reception areas, tagging the perception as self-generated. So when the corollary mechanism is malfunctioning, the person may experience an auditory hallucination by misperceiving his or her own thoughts as being externally generated. So, akala niya galing sa labas yung kanyang own thoughts, which is just from the frontal lobe. So, Kumar et al. Um, in the Industrial Psychiatry Journal, um, entitled, um, uh, in the journal, uh, in, in the article titled Hallucinations, Etiology and Clinical Implications, he um, discussed the hypothesis were in very high levels of dopamine in the limbic system and play a role in the emergence of hallucinations and delusions. And serotonin has also been implicated in the causation of hallucinations. Uh, this is based on the fact that a number of hallucinogenic drugs like LSDs can create um, auditory hallucinations. So acetylcholine um, in its uh, reduction in abnormalities in nicotinic and muscarinic receptor expression may also cause derangement and cholinergic transmission, uh, which has been involved in the past pathophysiology of hallucinations. 
So the GABA A um, is also studied no, um, through PET and SPEC studies. And GABA A receptor ligands show that the intensity of hallucinations was strongly associated with diminished GABA A binding, specifically in the lab. Anatomically, auditory hallucinations appear to involve the primary and association cortices, also the Broca's and the Wernicke's areas, subcortical, paralimbic, limbic regions, ventral striatum, and the thalamus. So furthermore, they suggested um, to be associated with the dismodulation of information flow from the ventral striatum to the thalamus, text caused by increased dopaminergic activity in the mesolimbic pathway. So the exact mechanism is not yet um, clearly um, defined yet, but um, these are some of the um, findings from known studies. Model. So with that, uh, this ends my report on the auditory system. Okay. Uh, thank you, me, no, for that um, very comprehensive report. So meaning doon sa auditor hallucination, it's more of doon sa brain lang lahat nag-work, no? that produces the sound, di ba? So, walang any na parang pareho. Like, for example, when we perceive something na sound na meron talagang outside, from outside stimulus. <clears throat> so, hindi nagaganon sa auditory hallucinations. It's more of sa brain lang lahat. Be on support. Okay. Sige. So, thank you. Um... Mekong, uh, meron ka bang gustong i-add dun sa previous report mo? For the research pala, sa next na lang kasi meron pa naman tayong isang Monday. Okay? So, yung reporter for the, sa, ano, sa research. <clears throat> na Hello? Ay. Na naririnig... Uh, Okay ba yung audio or hindi naririn? Okay naman. Ah, yes. Mekong, meron kang gustong i-add doon sa ano yung parang about sa visual hallucinations and what's happening in the brain? Ah, sige daw. Ay, sige po daw. Paano yung may share? Apa, who's po up po ito? Ah, magpahus po. Sana po, Doc. Okay na po, Mekong, can you start na? Hello? Uh, doc, uh, Dr. Yambao is having some technical difficulties, but we're still configuring his computer. Ah, okay, sige. 